uh, we, good morning, everyone. We have a half uh, fireside chat, half presentation. So, Peter, I don't know if I'm going to do this or this <laughs> as I kind of move you. through. Uh, we'll go through it. Wow. Uh, so, good morning. We got the lucky straw to have the last day bright and early at 8 a.m. Thanks, every troopers that we have out there today. Uh, I like to start this off, let's see if I go through here, a little interactive. So, I'm going to call on this table first. And we're going to call on this table now. I won't do that, actually. Sorry. But we will. I like to start on this for digital transformation as we go through. So think about this. The stat that was out, or this quote that was out there in 2008. So think back to 2008. Uh, I might have shared this with someone at a bar. So if you know the answer, don't immediately raise your hand. But there was a company, pretty uh, dominant in the marketplace at the time. Uh, and you know he's got this quote, I've been frankly confused by the fascination that everyone has with blank, that's blank company, they don't really have anything that we can't do or don't already do ourselves. So I'm gonna have a guess on who that one was. And you can shout out. You can't. <laughs> Ooh, I heard, who, Apple? Oh, who would have said that about Apple? So that's, that's true, Apple. That's the, so if that's the first part you're going, if you're saying it's Apple, and then who said it about them in 2008? I've, I've heard a lot of people say, did BlackBerry say that about Apple? It's a good one, because around 2008, screens started becoming very prevalent. Any other guesses? Oh, my, oh, oh, you, <laughs> it's a good, you said it about Ford Motor Company? No, it wasn't them. Uh, what's that? Oh, okay, also a good one around that time. Well, even, I think they lasted another good five, 15 years, right? So they were around, might have said that about Apple. I'll move us through just one, if I click play, Interesting, right? When's the last time anybody's been in a Blockbuster? <laughs> last five years? <laughs> uh, it's interesting, they actually even did a study uh, around this, one of their last studies when they talked about uh, downloading digital. And they had said that, and it's funny, you can make studies say anything, um, around the fact that they found it that their customers still loved going into stores because it was, they, they would, uh, let's see if I say this right, serendipitous? What's the plural of serendipity? We would serendipitous, I don't actually remember. Uh, we would serendipitously run into our neighbors in the area, right? So like they could run in and have an interaction with someone. Also, they loved opening and closing the boxes was the other main stat that they felt that there was a serious differentiator on. I don't know about you, but I still very much enjoy clicking download while naked in my bed at midnight <laughs> at night. So I watch, I probably overshared. We're in a self-care <laughs> summit though, so. Nightly things that we have going on there. Interesting little start. I think we've woken everybody up. Are we awake now? I'm awake. There we go. I'll talk a little bit just about Microsoft for a second. So we've gone through our own digital transformation along growth mindset. I'm not sure if you're at our session, but since Satya took the helm, uh, I think it was around 2014, we were definitely headed for uh, irrelevance. You know, our stock price was flat. It was an office and Windows company, and that's generally all it was. The stock market recognized that and didn't share a whole lot of it. So there was a whole bunch of things around digital transformation. It's a large organizational pivot that you go through. Uh, we did one ourselves, and a big thing about it that we talk about is growth mindset, and the biggest thing about that is failure. Um, does anybody remember a chatbot that we released back in 2016 called Tay? Anyone? Our marketing team did a great job of keeping this quiet then, and that's actually a beneficial thing for us. Um, Tay was released uh, out to the internet, and the whole point of her is she, she would go out and learn from everyone that she interacts with. We started with a Twitter account, put her out there, and she would start to learn. Now, different schools of thought say she might have been uh, compromised, attacked, but within 16 hours, she was transformed from a uh, wide-eyed infant in the internet to a a uh, racist drug wheeling mule for the cartel. <laughs> it was in 16 hours. We took her down, right, within that 16 hours. And old Microsoft would have, you know, to a degree ostracized that group, put them over to the corner, and never talked about them again. Um, the very next day, Satya wrote about, you know, a page and a half long memo to the entire organization, thanking the courage that that team had to go through and put together. That, you know, when you're first to a marketplace, you're going to skin your legs a little bit and you're going to work and you're going to figure things out. Um, and that 
that actually transitioned into, if you think about, you know, uh, Brad Smith, who's our chief legal officer, he wrote a book around tools and weapons. It transitioned into our uh, AI for good initiative that we had out there in the world to put ethical and environmental um, uh, concerns around cloud and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it gives you an idea of a lot of the things that we went through and we were able to apply and look at as one micro example as we shifted you know, our, our entire organization. Uh, I'll, I'll leave, well I won't leave with this, but the, the middle section of this is definitely uh, a mantra that I talk with with a lot of the customers and consumers that I work out there with today. We have this place and the cloud offers you to do this today. So it's our, our area of we want to think big, start, fat, or start small, act fast, and that allows us to change the world. And the great thing about the cloud is it allows us to do that. You can have all sorts of really big ambitions that you're looking for and trying to do. You can start small in very small little pilots and areas environments, and we're happy to work with folks from that perspective. And then it'll, and you can get up very, very quickly. Uh, that allows us to move forward and is a bit of our mantra. But then three qualities of leadership. So again, this ties up to Sachi and what we always drive into our, um, our environment and working with our employees. And that's providing clarity, creating energy, and driving for success. And those three areas we anchor ourselves around as leaders as we walk through within our organization today. All right, Peter, we're gonna get to you here pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, click through. One of the things, just so you understand, Microsoft, we're, we're both a CG company, a retailer, right? I think most folks have interacted with our products. We sell through to Best Buy, we throw, sell through to Walmart. And this slide is one of those that instantly goes out of date as soon as you put it up there. Uh, but it gives you an idea of what our organization environment looks like. Um, I'm gonna double tick click on our direct channel for a little bit. I was in Five Black Fridays, I spent in our Microsoft retail stores when we started around, I think I started around store, 18 or 19 when we first started. We just went international, so we were just going into Canada and Puerto Rico. Um, today we've got about 110 stores out there. We've got uh, three flagships, one in New York, one down in Sydney Pitt Street, and then another one in London opened up this year. Um, some There's some stats you can see over there on the right as far as the magnitude and the breadth that we've got. Uh, it's already up there, but another stat I like to ask is how many customers we've been able to cultivate on either one of our brick and mortar or retail properties. So we're up to about 60 million from that perspective. Um, high MPS rates, our turnover rates very low. So we've got some magic sauce that we share that we've been able to unlock internally that we like to then share and provide out to our customers as well. Uh, I'm gonna go through this because I personally don't like my face that much, apologies. <laughs> But if we walk through here, so my background, so I come from a grocer background, you can see up there it says Derringer, I think in the upper right hand corner, it was us and the Waltons guys. We were neck and neck for the 80s, I think. We didn't clearly went out from that perspective. Uh, they're, they're the winner there. But we started off in a grocery chain, spent a lot of my time there as youth. Um, from there, my consumer goods background, uh, half on process uh, manufacturing, so on the PepsiCo side, DSD side, really from PepsiCo Bottling Company, and then over to Hewlett Packard. I spent another six years over there, half on uh, engineering, and then the other half on our um, consumer goods category brand management section. And then in Microsoft, where I've got a, you know, it's a little bit of tenure, uh, I spent about five years in our M&A practice. Uh, if I clover, I mentioned retail stores. I spent five Black Fridays there, and then I've been leading our retail CPG industry for a bit. Plus, you'll see some board advisories and memberships. You'll see one out there. I think there's a throwout to our GMDC. Guys, Trey, you can get that picture real quick. You'll see your logo on us. Did, did you get it? That'll be on LinkedIn in an hour. Please like, or Trey starts to have issues by noon. <clears throat> so, so who are we and what we do, right? I'll, I'll touch on this just a little bit. I mentioned transformation. So one of the things or the highlight, I guess, that my team gets to do is we're bringing two things, and that's both to our customers and to our sales force, and that's industry relevance as well as, as, far, and as, well as technical capabilities. So half of my team, if you look at all these logos right here, um, the requirement I have is that we've done at least five years as a practitioner in that marketplace. So in all those logos, again, I've got folks who've done five up to 26, in some cases, years in the market, that's as a practitioner. So we can have those, uh, let's say, credible conversations with C-suites that are out there today, and we've been building and driving our practice from that perspective. So once we've had a really great conversation and you know, we've, getting a, we've gotten, let's say, a real problem from the customer or client, we'll then go through and I've got a couple different things that I can apply. Um, the other half of my team are what we call industry technology strategists. And those are technical project cons um, uh, project accelerators. And they've been able to go in and like, we'll train data scientists up on our machine learning platform. In the span that I've usually talked, we built a chat bot off of their frequently asked questions for them. 
Um, we've done hackathons for three days up to a week. So we spend a good amount of time in that area. Actually, when we think about you know starting fast, we'll start fast and build those. And then you know at the bottom there is partner experience. That's why you'll see Peter up here today. Um, we, I think 86% of our wins that we had last year with our partner ecosystem, and we, we have, and our partners have built an incredible amount of um, IP on top of the white space. So we have the platform, our partners are able to then work and develop on that last mile piece, and there's really some niche valuable IP that you guys have we're gonna go into in a little bit. Um, so that's sort of the what we bring, the three-pronged approach, and then over on the right is how we apply that. And there's a couple examples, I think, on the next slide. I'll skip this one. Into our creator's design workshop. So the interesting thing about this you'll see is we'll bring all sorts of different teams together into an organization. So we'll have uh, developers, artists, uh, business value assessment people, um, designers, uh, executives down to low level, all sorts of different groups to go through and build and sort of a, three, a one to three day session around what we can and can't deliver and what we can do and what the next iteration of what they're trying to develop are. And so there's a couple of logos in here you'll see 7-Eleven, Safeway, Albertsons that we've gone through and built some of these. And most recently we had one um, around Starbucks and I'll share just a quick story on that piece, uh, which is around the blueberry muffin uh, problem that they have. And we dubbed it the blueberry muffin project. For them, if you think about it, their highest time that anyone goes into the store is from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning, right? And in that, if they've, they've really changed the game as far as uh, mobile ordering goes, right? In some cases, you'll have more people waiting in line for mobile ordering than are actually in the store. Uh, and one of their issues was inventory management. So as you go through and if they pull out, we call it the blueberry muffin example, if you pull out that blueberry muffin, the whole tray goes down, then suddenly your inventory goes from, let's say, 12 down to zero. And if you have someone come in that's already ordered those and they're looking for that uh, great consumable, um, they then have to go through a make right situation, which means they're cutting into their margins, they're giving someone something else, there's a negative customer end sat and they go out and they leave the room. So what we wanted to do is allow the associates, they, can't, they only have one terminal, which is the point of sale, so they can't quickly update that change that might have happened in the back room. So we just simply put a little chat bot, which has voice recognition on their lapel, with about three orders. It was update inventory, close inventory, um, update customer feedback. They were able to tap that, and from there, they could directly update the inventory to zero, to 12, to six, to whatever that might be. That would directly then go into the system and update into their mobile area. So that was a, a thing that we started with in a very different area of what we were trying to solve and then ended up there after the first couple of days. That's now out in um, 22 of their China stores. This was a three-day investment put out there in about three weeks, and it's 22 of their China stores we're developing that today. So interesting kind of ways to pick that up and move forward. As far as the retail agenda goes, and this is to a degree consumer goods as well, we pulled a lot of our C-suite executives and came up with this sort of heat map around all of the things that they care about into this fiscal as well as next. And the interesting thing about that is we're able to put all those together into these four pillars. And for the rest of today, we're going to talk about these four pillars and examples that we have in each of those areas. So know your customers. Big area as far as where we focus and looking at and how they can work through those. And if you're a CPG company, we'll call that consumers. Uh, empower employees. So we feel that the productivity uh, is a great way for people to focus and quickly flip and drive the brand ambassadors that you have directly with your customers and consumers. We've switched this to develop and uh, deliver intelligent supply chain. I really liked when it was optimized operations before because it covered finance, supply chain, marketing, strategic planning, covered those whole areas, but we've put you know, a, an emphasis on that space. And then reimagine retails, everything as we mentioned from chatbots to AI to arti you know, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, everything that's new inside of a store that they can interact with. Of those, right, I said we pulled uh, the notions together that our executives had and had noted in our focus group, uh, aligned them to each one of these so you can see where we put those into the top market and made sure that we had a good offering back to our customers and clients today. And I think from here, we'll go ahead and, oh, we, we've got a couple getting notice slides. So, so in this one, just, just to set context, um, we've, we've been getting notice, so there's a lot of public reference today as far as where we've been able to affect and enact change in the marketplace. Um, these are a lot of the public references that we've noted that we're in with uh, many of our uh, consumer brands as well as our retailers. There's definitely been a shift, and, and I think the differentiator we have maybe with some of the other large cloud providers is that 
we don't push a dependence with us to be successful. It's an independence with us and your brand to help you thrive. So we believe that each one of our customers have a valued niched area that they do better than anyone else in the world. And we want to help enable that either with or as part of with us. Um, so there's very much a trust uh, piece that we have when we go through and talk with our customers and clients about how we're going to execute and move forward. Uh, one of the biggest examples, a lot of questions I get is around Walmart. So we talk about the interaction and Doug McMillan has been one of our uh, biggest advocates as far as what we're looking to do and change the marketplace. Um, in that we went through and there were these four areas. It's very similar to the four strategic pillars that you saw before and what we went after with them. And, and there's not a lot, I mean, a lot of, that we've done has been written out there in the, in the press. Um, under NDA, I can go into many, many more things that we've been able to do. But essentially, one of the biggest is through a lot. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to do and look at them with, it was save money and save costs to help then reinvest that into their environment. Uh, we had a target of a billion dollars to go save within our initiative and we hit that last year. Now, if you break that down and look at that a billion dollars, they were able to take that 500 million of it and reinvest it into all sorts of different investments that they have and that we could partner with together and that other amount they're able to save. Um, that's when you see it affords them to do a lot of these things that you can look here um, today, right? When you look at robots, scanning the shelves for inventory optimization, when you look at the cloud factories, we're able to lift and shift and move a lot of their apps over into that environment. We were able to do and, and enable them to move into a retailer of the future. You know, Walgreens is a self-care summit. This one, we talk about bringing healthcare to the neighborhood. We're a little early on sharing any stories on this since we've announced and we're going through what that is. So probably at the next self-care summit, we're gonna have all sorts of really awesome stories to, to share. Oops, sorry, that's Kroger. Walgreens is the one I meant to get to right here. Um, and so uh, we'll have a lot more that we can talk with from that perspective around how we're really bringing healthcare to the neighborhood and a lot of the examples that we have amongst retail and CPG that will apply in that blend of pharma and retail today. I will go back for one second to talk about the Kroger piece. So, you know, we, we believe that, and I mentioned before, every company has a value niche that they do better than anyone else out there in the marketplace. Uh, we, we look at that as a, rev, a net new revenue stream to go through and that they can build and derive and bring that out to many other customers. So that Kroger Edge isn't something that they just have in their environment today, but also it's another one that they have out in the marketplace that they can sell to other grocers, that they can sell to other, let's say, uh, PetSmart or Petco or other providers that are out there today that have a edge or a shelf selling motion. Um, great thing, uh, the CG companies that go through and partake in this, right, they're seeing up to 40% lifts in the sales that they have on shelf today. Um, in store, they're getting a lot of valued benefit by not having the updated price tags immediately on there by saving time for in-store associates. Um, so it's, it's been a, a great join message between, we're always looking for a connection between CG and retailers, and this is one of those that have hit well. Uh, let's see, I hit on those. The four pillars that we talk to when we walk through, this is really the intelligent customer journey. So you'll see the four pillars that we talked with in the way that we went through this environment. Um, we're gonna talk a bit and there'll be some stories when we get into know your customer. Uh, there, there's a stat out there and I won't ask anybody about this one, but Walmart, um, Amazon, they make as a percentage of revenue, 30% uh, of their money off of their recommendation engine. Right, So that's knowing you, who you are, what you've clicked on, your favorites, and based on that, they're able to make an incredible additional amount on recommending like products around that piece. Now, unfortunately, when you walk into a store, right, brick and mortar companies lose a lot of that touch. The CG companies don't have a great connection back to the customer that's in there today as far as their behavior, where they're spending time and where they're going. And so we've got some stories, I'll get into it and know your customer in a second. And well, we look at personalization and we'll talk about this with Peter to, as a proximity, identity and content. So knowing that individual, recognizing the places and the habits that they're spending time in and then giving them relevant information as they walk through the stores. Uh, we'll get into that one here in a little bit. So I think without further ado, we're gonna move down to our fireside chat piece of this. Yeah. Peter, thank you. You've been very patient as I've walked through those first slides. We talked last night and I told him that as a Microsoft no slides, guy, right? yeah. <laughs> I'm very naked without slides. So no slides to Microsoft means about 322. So I think we're at slide 60 now. Went through that pretty quickly. So I, I just have uh, 50 or 60 slides to go through. <laughs> we, should, we should be good. How's everybody now, doing out there? The big difference is a trillion dollar company gets 60 slides where, you know, a couple hundred millions, I get one. <laughs> um, but it's a good one. It is a good one. Um, so yeah, know your customer, huge. Um, technology is driving everything and the customers these days want you to know them, they want you to value them. 
and the brands want you know loyalty, brand loyalty, and they really want to drive as much profit as possible. As possible, everything we do can be done with human, uh, with people, you know the human factor. The problem is the time to do it and knowing your customer. So we have a an AI data platform. Take data in, does all this great magic, and spits out that right message to the right customer. All built on top of Microsoft, as you know, you were seeing that layer, and we built on top. But the power of it is knowing your customer and getting that right message out at the right time. So you have a room full of data scientists. They're taking all of your great data. And three weeks later, they've segmented, and they've decided the right campaign, and they send it out, and they realize that they missed the customer three weeks ago. And that was the problem that we wanted to solve. Um, so if you think about AI and technology doing all of this in real time, we can see the trends before they hit. We know about you, not your segmentation, but we actually know who you are. Um, and I like to always go back to, uh, think of like advertising on TV. It's Monday night football, you're watching ESPN, everything's great. We know who's in the room. Well, you don't. You know who you think is in the room. And if you look at the stats, it's you know men 18 to 34. Well, that doesn't happen. Um, the difference is it's my mobile phone, it's me, and I want to know what's going on. When I show up, I want you to talk to me. I want you to know who I am. And that's the value of what technology can bring. So I throw up this slide because uh, it really helps me uh, explain what we do. And some of you have heard it because a lot of you have been to the booth, but I like to use Coke and Pepsi as my example on what personalization is because it, it hits the root of it really fast. Um, so this is uh, you know Chris getting gas in his Ferrari right before he cut his hair. <laughs> um, but so imagine Chris goes up to the pump. Two weeks ago. A couple weeks ago. Imagine Chris goes up to the pump, and on his phone it vibrates, and he looks down, and it says, get 50% or 50 cents off a Coke. This is great, right? He's going to run right into that C store, go buy a Coca-Cola for 50 cents off. The problem is Chris likes Pepsi. Chris looks at it and not only says, you know, I don't want a Coke, I like Pepsi, because how many people like both? It's usually I love Coke and hate Pepsi, or I love Pepsi and hate Coke. There's very few people that cross that. So not only did I lose Chris as a customer, because he's not going to buy anything, he's not going to walk into the C-store at all, but he may even be offended at that the brand would even offer up something that he doesn't like. The brand doesn't know me. How terrible. I'm not even going to fill up my gas the next time I go. That's one attribute of personalization. That's just looking at just one thing that Chris likes. What if I know a lot more about him? What if I know that he filled up yesterday, which means he burned throughout his entire tank of gas in one day? Pretty likely in the next two days, he's going to need gas again. Now when I see him coming close to my gas station, he gets the message five cents off gas. Chris pulls over, fills up his tank again. Guess what he gets when he pulls inside? Get 50 cents off a of Pepsi if you buy Doritos. I mean, and, and from there, we're growing revenue, we're growing brand loyalty, and we're giving Chris what he wants. We know him now. We know who he is because it's his phone. It's not ESPN, and I think Chris is in the room watching TV. No, no, we know Chris is there. And it doesn't matter if he's in his Ferrari, in a rental car, in something completely different because it's his phone. And when was the last time you gave your phone to someone and said, yeah, go down the street and go get me something to drink? It's your phone in your pocket or in your purse. Um, and it, it really gives us that know your customer feel no matter where they are. And that's just one example. Um, I'm trying to think. So uh, McDonald's, Ikea, 7-Eleven are our three big marquee customers. Uh, with McDonald's alone, just in Japan, there's 50 million active users on any given day. We, we process over 300 million transactions a day. You can't do that if it's manual. It has to be automated. It has to be fast and it has to be powerful. So it's all about taking your data figuring out what that data means, and then acting on it as quick as possible. So again, you can do this with people power, and we've been doing it for years with people power. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is it's segmentation, and you think this is what that segment wants. What if I don't fit the segment? You know, and, and what I did five years ago is not what I did last week. And that's the other thing that I, I always like to bring up about data is I get brands that say, I have five, seven, eight years of data on my customer. You should just be able to run it through that machine and tell me exactly what they want. And we laugh and we go, yeah, well, you know, we absolutely will. And we're probably going to use the last two weeks of data. So I'm glad you've been capturing that for five years. But the real power is, what did you do last week? What did you do the week before? Maybe the month before. Because, I mean, if you just got married, if you just had a baby, well, you didn't have that five years ago. So your, your plans change. Your habits change. Maybe I smoked. Now I don't. 
So offering me up, you know, three packs of cigarettes at, you know, $5 off, I quit smoking. You should know that about me. So. Very good. No, what I like about the, so the McDonald's example you bring up um, is a good one around taking external factors, many different data sources, and bringing them together and harnessing a true personalized message. Um, the example is, as I remember it, is right, you had, uh, I think there was an a proximity location where if you were near a train station, right, that was coming to pick you up, and a McDonald's, and that train was late by about, what was it, I think five or six minutes, right, or maybe 10 minutes, um, there would be an offer that would be sent to an individual's, individual's phone. And based on the time of day, weather, who that person was, I think it was student versus worker versus uh, business professional, um, you know, we talked about seasonality already, you would get a free offer, and that would be fries, burgers, Sunday, each one of those different components, each one specific to that individual. Um, they would uh, redeem that offer, go into store, pick that up, but then there was a tray value increase that they could go through and pick once you have them. Um, so then once in store, it would be prepared, be ready, but then they could cross sell and do a further uh, addition. I think if I remember right, the stats were something like, I don't remember the percent conversion, but I do know the tray value size increased 47% during that campaign. And I mean, 47% in tray value increase in McDonald's, that's true sales dollars, that's growth, right? So it's very important to them. And that was one of the first micro areas to start with it. Then they took that out to other areas across, not just Japan, but in the Northern Europe, right? And other places across the globe. Um, well, and if, if you think of that, that was a segmentation decision. This was before AI really kicked in. So the wow. platform has AI and it's also machine learned. And really the difference is machine learns means I give Chris an offer, he did this with it, all right, learn from that. I give him a different offer that's similar, learn from that. Think of A-B testing. Mm. The platform does that, that's learning. AI is the predictive piece. All right, because Chris does this, this, and this, I think he's gonna like this. And then it goes back through the machine learning and it changes that prediction. So that entire campaign was before AI, before the prediction. So we were doing the segmentation of you know, 18 to 34, we're gonna, and we're gonna push these people in. Fast forward that, throw AI into this, and now it's not, here's this group, we're gonna give them an offer. It's everyone on that train station gets a different offer based on something else that they've done. So instead of me pushing a group of, everyone over here is gonna get um, you know, Big Macs, and everyone over here is gonna get fries, it's you're gonna get a fry, you're gonna get a shake, you're, you know, and, it, and it really picks out the individuals, and it ignores the people that they know they're not gonna get in. So it's, it's precise and it drives revenue. And it's the reason why we're driving about three and a half billion dollars worth of offers and incentives mm -hmm. across our customers. Mm -hmm. you, you can't have a lift like that if it's just you know, splatter. Just, you know, we'll hope that half the room goes in. You, you're never gonna drive real revenue. And, and it's a good point. So for us, if I, I know this isn't a fast food convention, this is a self-care summit. So as we look at the change from McDonald's to other areas, and particularly what we're doing within either Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS, or any of the pharmacies that sit inside the grocers today, if you have to come in for set prescription, mm -hmm. right, there's a lot of other things that you can drive and walk through traffic of an individual in store. Um, as mentioned, I, or I don't think I mentioned this before, um, the stat, I, another stat I have on our, our Amazon giant is that I think it was around nine to $12 billion that they spent in Q4 on free shipping free shipping alone, right? That was just in one quarter. So you could extrapolate that out. You could take a guess of what the full year is. Um, but they've gotten a whole modern economy used to free shipping, right? Now, why that's tough for big brick and mortar companies is because one, that starts to cut into their margins for shipping costs. Mm -hmm. And two, right, substitutions are the biggest hit that they don't like. So if I'm picking up a fresh product, specifically, I've requested an avocado, but an artichoke shows up in that, <laughs> in that order. I mean, it's a very different type of dip that I'm making that night. Um, so the, there is still a push to bring people in store. There's still a push to make that frictionless experience even better. Um, and we talk through ways once to get them in, once you can entice them in, how you can then um, take advantage of that customer journey that they go through. And I was talking to uh, Karen from CVS and the fact that CVS now owns Aetna. Think of that huge data source now. Healthcare, you know what's wrong with me, you know the prescriptions I'm on, and you have a whole retail store behind you. So now when I walk in, it's not just know me and the chips are over there, it's we know you shouldn't be eating chips, here's a substitute for that. So you're actually making me healthier by knowing who I am. Um, I used to go back and, and think about the difference between a Frappuccino and three brownies. There was a study I saw, and this was five years ago now, but it was healthier to have three brownies than it was to drink a Frappuccino, just because of sugar content and calories. But people don't know that. And you know, it, it's those choices that, that knowing your customer can help you with. It's not changing them. It's not saying, hey, you can't eat that. I'm gonna eat something anyway. 
but here's a smarter solution, and maybe I'll think about that. Maybe I will get the salad with the chicken on it as opposed to the burger. Mm -hmm. We have another um, provider, another partner um, that goes through and based on um, your gluten-free ordering, you can walk through when you come into stores today, you can go through your order, submit that in into the um, recipe, and they'll recommend and suggest different areas if you're gluten-free based on the recipe the Wizard of set today. So you can go through and actually make healthier choices based on the engine that we have in the background. I do don't want to forget our CG companies. So when we talk about personalization, I think there's a Trojan horse there that I'll mention in a little bit. So I'll give an example here. You guys can probably see there's some Mars examples. There's some, that's some uh, corrugate aggregate or the end caps that are done. So there's, there's lots of money. And I think there was a stat, uh, $174 billion spent on um, in-store trade and trade promotion management across the entire industry today. So in this example that we have here, um, if I kick through, we're gonna start with Pepsi Frito-Lay. Um, in this example, right, they went in, uh, it was very important for them to track, and you can see that little blue uh, aggregate stand that went out there. So what type and which products are going out? How often are those going out there? And if I expect a one to one and a half, even to 2% lift on those that are out there today, I wanna make sure that they're getting out there. So that's from production, build, distributor, all the way into the back of office to front of office. Um, how do I track that? Today, what we did is we added very simple little sensors, cheap sensors onto each one of those units as they're produced. We're able to ship those out there as they go out there and go into store. The app that sits on the worker, or the distributor, distributor that sits in there at DSD is able to find, pick that up, and then send a signal back that shows this is where that product actually is. I'll talk about the Chester the Cheetah campaign that they had around Easter, Easter last year, and it was give the Easter bunny a break, right? And so they, again, they averaged, they, they thought about a 1 to 1.5% 1 uh, increase in sales through that campaign. They shipped 12,000 of those units out there in the market. And again, does anyone have a guess on how many of those actually landed into the front of house of stores out of 12,000? Any? You guys awake out there? I can't see because the light, so if you shout out, I, I won't know. Sure, it was of the 12,000 assets sent out there today, do we know how many that Pepsi realized went actually into store and showed up as designed by marketing? Half, so 6,000? Six thousand? Good guess, Six, any others? 4,000, 4,000? Sorry, and less, yeah. Uh, actually, it was 600. <laughs> that, so math kids out there, someone helped me out with this before. That's a staggering 5%. 5% of them went out there that I designed today, right? So if you expected a lift, marketing can think they did a fantastic job, but only 5% of them got out there. I never heard about this campaign, right? I'm, I'm not sure if anybody else did. So what it offers them to do is a couple things. One, if I know an asset is out there and I can see 600 of my 12,000, two, I can you know, lay claim to go after that. Uh, I can work back with a retailer to say I'm not getting the shelf space that I, that I purchased so negotiate a different component. Um, I can also uh, then work through and figure out, well, if there's only that amount and my drivers are only seeing this, let's spike it up or drop it down in other areas. The, the interesting thing about it though, one is I can depreciate the asset, I can get my money back, I can work through different areas, but it's the opportunity and the Trojan horse to customer that is the biggest bet for Pepsi here. And that means, right, not a lot of people, and we talk about apps being the key to this, right? Not a lot of folks have a Pepsi or Frito-Lay app. And that's true or lost out on my CG companies. And if you look at, you know, the retailers, they own that relationship today. However, through our partnerships like an Alt Recipes or a Redbox, we can bring 60 million customers as a proximity touch to your customers back to your CG companies directly today, right? So that's 60 million more people that you can touch, look at, and drive and push a message directly back to based on the parameters that Peter just talked about before, right? So now what's really important about Frito-Lay and let's say Redbox, right? If the, a Redbox person walks through and they're getting a movie, the combination of what's better than movie and a drink or movie and popcorn or tying those things up, you can make and change that offer. Um, so and that, that, sorry. No, no go ahead. No, no, I thought you were done. Um, we ran a campaign with McDonald's over Advent last year. Uh, it was in a couple, I think 13 select countries. Um, it was a new offer every day, but it was targeted. So it wasn't just everyone got a new offer. Um, and they saw a lift in that month of about 515 new customers per day per store based off of this. The uptake was enormous mm. because again, it's targeted. It's aimed right at you. And the new offer per day, it wasn't one offer across the entire footprint. They had about 13 different offers or 14 different offers every day. So you may get a different offer than the person sitting next to you. But the whole point of it was 
using technology to drive you in, to Chris's point. It's not, it's not about how much you can buy, it's about buying the right thing, because then you're happy and you come back and you buy again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mentioned the partnership that we just talked about before, right, and engagement. Anybody heard of Wild Mike's that's out there, Ultimate Pizza? I, yeah, I hadn't either. Um, and so these guys, what they had here is a very simple campaign that we partnered with with Rectbox. It was, there was no promotion here. It was just a notification. And it was pizza in a movie, right? Like, want to put a better combo together? Uh, and then they tagged Mike's Ultimate Pizza in there, right? Like another, it's, it's a chance to touch someone as they're going through a store in an area that tied. And you can see the promotional content that sits on that device, on the, the unit today, as well as to their device. The stats are hard to argue with. I mean, 42%, 62%, 60% increase in sales, so an average of 55 over the time that they ran that campaign. So where you're having relevant offers to people based on what they're, and the time that they're spending in store, you know, does turn to true dollars and true amounts. And that was through uh, Wild Mike's for Walmart campaign, and I can't remember the exact location. But um, yeah, you're seeing actual benefit in that from that perspective. Now take, take that even to another, <clears throat> excuse me, another level where if instead of Mike's, it was targeted to a product that you personally care about. Mm. And that's where the, the lift from 60% goes to 80% or 75% because it's truly about a product you care about. To Chris's point, maybe it's pizza and popcorn for me. It's pizza and Pepsi for him. It's pizza, uh, I'm sorry, movie and popcorn, movie and Pepsi, movie and a pizza. You can let the consumer's behavior decide what that offer is and it gives you more power on what you wanna push. If they say pizza, it could be Mike's in some stores. Well, my store, I'm low on Mike's because we blew through it. I'm gonna substitute that without having to change marketing. It's just the next ad that comes up in my phone is someone's different. Mm -hmm. I did, it was seven times conversion rate and 47% increase in tray value size. Gotta remember a few stats as we go through it. Ooh, we, we talk about AI and ML and actually realizing and understanding this. I was sticking on the McDonald's example here. Um, and in, if we start to shift and we think about employees and empowerment and what they have in the shelf today, uh, many of the workers as they go through, and if you make an order right, there's a transcription of what you've ordered, what you're wanting, and how that comes through in uh, an actual uh, list or menu. Um, we found that as you start to do four or five different things together, the human mind starts to get fragmented as far as the permutations that they can remember. So I'm filling up a drink, I'm putting fries, I'm putting a burger together. I heard what they said, but I've got to refer to on uh, multiple combinations. So everyone's probably heard, do we have sound? I don't know if we have sound. Do we not have sound in here? Oh, it's starting to come through. I can hear it, it's quiet though. Can we turn it up a little bit? I didn't. I'm, we're, we're, we're playing on the fly. You can kind of hear it. It's your typical kind of wah, 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 but he's asking no. for, there we go. Um, one fry and a large coffee, two cream. This is the only cream. sound, by the way, so thank you. <laughs> Would you like that fry to be large? Uh, yes, thank you. Would you like barbecue sauce with those nuggets? No, sweet and sour. So it, it's somewhat of a complex is order. order yes. okay, that he goes through, he's saying, I want this with this, add this, take this away, go back. And through voice recognition and learning tool, you'll hear, oh, we need it back. <laughs> so you're hearing it transpose what he's asking for on the left, and that's turning it into the order so that we can see it on the right. So voice recognition, the cognitive model, is hearing that, addressing what she's saying versus what he's saying. We have a learn, train model for a few weeks, bringing that together and harnessing it to show what the actual order receipt will be. Again, not to replace the order taker inside of McDonald's today, but enhance and make sure that they're getting the order efficiency right. Um, again, just another example of how we're bringing uh, AI voice recognition cognitive services to the table. The, the Nordstrom Rack story I want to share, because this is another one that's very similar, and again, we like to apply these 
um, you know, Jamie Nordstrom has challenged their stores to be more intelligent and more relevant to their consumers today, uh, specifically their highest end customers. So you talked about the importance of an app, right? Nordstrom, if you have the Nordstrom app installed in your phone, effectively you'll spend two to three times more than those that don't. So one thing, I wanna figure out how I can move more of my folks through that environment. How can I get them into that store today so they'll actually, um, or into that ecosystem and give them a good value exchange so they'll download and use it. And then once there, give them that value exchange that's strong, that you're getting the things out of it that you want. Um, so for them, uh, we worked on two specific campaigns that I can talk about. Uh, we put 300 sensors in each one of the stores, right? So it was simply a way to identify and track folks when they come in, and that sensor wakes up the app, works in the background, recognizes who that person is, sends all the information up to the cloud into their ML model. Now what they worked through was, and the, the algorithm was their own, which said here's um, a specific person as they walk through a store, based on time of day and location, we're gonna give them uh, a free redeemable offer. It was $25 to $50 gift card. And it was their Nordstrom Love campaign around surprise and delight. Um, I'm convinced that you did have to be a female because I put my, that phone in my kid's backpack and he ran all over that store. We didn't get it once, uh, not one time. But um, as far as that went through, people walked through in each of that area could redeem and take that offer. Um, we didn't get actual stats from them back on redemption, but we did see in the three weeks leading up to holiday when we ran this, they saw 6,000 more downloads in an unadvertised campaign across 13 stores. So they're bringing more people into that ecosystem. Uh, once in that ecosystem, then it's, you have the offer to provide, but then we worked on a um, Endless aisle. So if you were in, uh, and there's a couple different things, it depends on your creepy factor. If you were uh, in a, well, actually, we'll start with the on the south piece. If you were by Hunter Boots, right, and you tried on the right color, um, the cut that you liked, or let's say it was the right um, kind of feel for size, but you wanted a different color, um, uh, based on you were there, you could elect in to order um, any one of the other 25 different options that they had online and have that shipped to home. Um, so Hunter Boots, handbags, any one of those other things, actually cribs that they have in their other area was another spot that you could go find something you like and off, uh, redeem that offer or create an offer in store directly. Um, they saw a 19% increase in in-store mobile conversion based on those relevant messages we sent down to them. Uh, finally, as I mentioned, there was a um, offer that they did if you were, and this depends on the creepy factor, if you were a male in the female section or a female in the male section or a, you know, an adult in the child section for a significant amount of time, they assumed that you were actually buying a gift. So they would push a, you know, searching for that special someone. Here are three or four offers that we have today going specifically as far as a very general broad campaign. Uh, we didn't get actual stats on that piece as far as the turn, but they kept all of those offers in for folks who had the actual app today. Um, so another example, when we talk about personalization and proximity, identity and content, from all the different stages of broad blast, nurture, uh, promotional effectiveness to the deep special, uh, specialized specific offers that yeah, Flexure has today. And if you deliver the right content, the increases in the downloads of your apps will go up. I mean, they saw, what was it, 17,000 you said, increase? Uh, oh, there's a 19, you mean 19% increase, 19 increase in in-store conversion. No, no, the downloads of that. Oh yeah, 6,000, 6,000 6, 6, in three weeks while we tracked it. So there was much more that happened after that. We just didn't have the actual time to pull so it. The reason why I bring that up is, again, it's all about experience and knowing your customer. Uh, the McDonald's app in Japan is the number one app in the app store. McDonald's is the number one app in the app store in Japan, but it's because of the utility it provides. And that's the same thing that Nordstrom found. If you offer the right solution, people will find it and they'll download it and they'll use it themselves. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it continues, right? So we have another example with frictionless fuel at the pump. It was a, a piece that we rolled out with them to essentially the only thing you need to go if you install or have the Safeway app, the only thing you have to do is drive up, pull out, uh, get out of the car, select grade and pump. It recognizes you, who you are, the offer that you have, you can redeem. And then you can see the offers down there below, right? You can start to target and personalize the messages that you wanna directly uh, provide to those people today. Um, it's actually also, we're also part of their uh, Just For You uh, offer. So it they used to blast just every single promotion that they had in a store in the app. Didn't recognize if you came in or you didn't. Uh, today, as you go in now, it's actually targeted based on sensors to the actual aisle that you're in. You'll only see the offers based on those where you're at today. Again, uh, larger organizations are on a journey. As they walk through that journey, there's different ways that they may or may not be um, evolved in that transformation. Yeah. 
Um, we'll start to get to employees. You know, the one I think we're running out of time that I want to get to, and again, I'll do it for our uh, consumer goods folks in the room. I'll jump ahead to out of our Microsoft stores and what we offer in Macy's is a decent example. So in, in Macy's, what they did, you know, the interesting thing about Macy's is that the most important thing, I'm not sure if anyone knows that they care about for their store associates, is accounts, meaning credit cards. It's the number one thing that they wanted to drive in their store. Um, it's also, uh, as they go through that, they, they wanted to make sure that they could uh, work on employee retention. I think they had a, a massive turnover, at least at time when they were going through. So. With Macy's, we introduced uh, an in-store mobile application, a bespoke app based on Teams that one, we could basically pull the uh, managers out of the back office onto the front of office so they could find the people who are doing the best uh, and strongest job of account redemption, um, bring them out, work through those, and then push that out through their environment. Um, they saw a uh, roughly 28% decrease in churn because they felt that they were uh, spending more time out with their employees and keeping them longer. And they saw about a 19% increase in in-store account activation during the time that they ran through this campaign. So uh, seeing real value when you start to work through and get it down to your employees. Uh, Mars in the perfect store, let's see if I click forward. I do wanna show, this is probably the last one based on AI, ML, and cognitive services. So again, as I mentioned at the shelf, it's very important to CG companies, they've got that retail execution and they're getting the shelf the way that they want it in stores today. So if I click, uh, play. There we go. This should be going through. This is the video of an app. So we did this and piloted it in Russia at the time with Mars. So if anyone knows Russian, please tell me what this means. I think it's stores. Um, but they're um, able to have the route optimized to the place that they're trying to go. So then this based on the spot where they've got to, got to look at. And then the important piece as you start to go through it is I'm going to go ahead and look at what the shelf looks like today. So if you can see this, this shows someone starting to go in there and he's going to go look at his specific section. Um, and they're walking through now, right? So there's gonna be another individual that he's stepping through in this example. They're gonna get to the spot that they wanna go to. Um, I don't remember, this is Mars? No, this is the Pepsi Frito-Lay example. So in a very quick, fast snapshot, you saw how fast that was done. It's starting to recognize what they have, what they do, and what they don't. What connects, what doesn't. So you're not necessarily relying on the DSD or the sales individual to guess or share or put what that is, or even someone else to look at pictures later. You're capturing it, seeing what's connected, seeing what's not, and in real time, allowing them to t push that back to corporate. And he can then, based on that, make recommendations. Now, when you start to get to that long aisle, you can see it starting to track and see what that looks like. He's gonna start to stitch together, right? So it's going through and showing and it, it's pulling it down what it looks like. So main beverage before and after. He's gonna go through here and look at the beverage aisle. And as he's walked through, it's gonna stitch the full aisle. So he'll get one snapshot, start to move over. It's you know simple when you look at um, it from a perspective of panorama. But he's able to walk through, capture what each one of those are, and then you'll see it start to pull together and look at the execution that they have on the floor. So again, if, if you look at it, it's very important, again, to our CG companies, is my brand being represented on the shelf? Is that there as it should be? Are the prices the way that I think they should be? And all through real time and real offers, you can capture all those, put them together, and, and share what that looks like. And I think I'll see that go through, and, and the images will be uploaded, and the recommendations will come in and be checked for results that will come through if there is any. There we go. So it'll show the percentage, 75%, 61%, what the breakdown is, how well it's connected. Again, I don't speak Russian, so I don't know all of those uh, components, but it's starting to click through. Anyways, um, I think we had about at times, so we were gonna go to about 8.50 this morning. Um, I think I'll take an, and then this connects up to the um, Perfect Store initiative they have with Mars. Um, I, think, I think we'll pause here at this moment, see if there's just any questions in general from the audience. We don't have to. I know this is super early in the morning. Everyone's kind of waking up. I'm waking up uh, Sunday, 8 a.m. I think we're close to 9, last run. Um, we'll close here. If you do have any questions, let us know. Uh, Peter here from Plexure, Chris here from Microsoft. Uh, we have lots of different stories and examples that we touched on, but if you need anything else, definitely reach out and we go from there, yeah? Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.